And so I would visit here and I would practice and study the Dharma, the teachings of Buddhism and mm-hmm. meditation and Dorje Kasan and mm-hmm. all that. And uh, it really, it didn't teach me, it like really showed me mm-hmm. who I could be or was yeah. fundamentally. And uh, without that, you know. Well, there you go, Wayne. Yeah. That's the story. to be here with my longtime uh, friend and the director of Karma Chilling, Jane Arthur. Jane, good to have you. My pleasure, Waylon. Yeah. It's nice to see you all grown up. Yeah. <laughs> it, took a, it took a little while. But. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're in Vermont at Karma Chilling, um, where I lived during high school, and uh, it was my home away from home when I was in college, and that's when I first met you, I think. Right, yep. Back in the 90s, Definitely, maybe. yep. It was yeah. the late 90s I lived here, 97 to 2000. Yeah. And you would come up regularly as yeah. a break from college. Right. Um, and I loved it here. And this is my first time back in way too long, in I think 14 years or something. Wow. Um, and you're now, you've done many things. Um, <laughs> a long list in the Shambhala Buddhist mm. uh, kingdom or mandala mm-hmm. or world. Um, you're now director of Karma Chilling. I am. I am, and I have been director for the last seven years. Seven years, wow. Yeah, seven years. Has it gone quickly or slowly? Yeah, when I look back, you know, it's one of those things that in the moment it can seem slow, but when you look back, it's gone by really, really fast. Mm. Has it been fun? It has been fun. Mm. Not every moment. Sure. I mean, it's been, I think, a deeply human experience, you know, which means you have good days and you have not so good days. But in general, I think it's been, uh, yeah, really my favorite job ever. Really? Really. Wow. Really, yeah. So that kind of reminds me, maybe you could tell us how you came, when you were younger, how you first came to the Shambhala Buddha stuff. Yeah, I wasn't that much younger, which I think is sort of interesting in that I was already into my 40s. Mm-hmm. And I had been a, a nurse and then a lawyer huh. and um, really thought, gosh, you know, I ought to have it all together and be really happy. But I wasn't. Mm-hmm. And um, it was just a set of auspicious coincidences like it is for everyone. And I ended up sitting with a small Tibetan Buddhist group in Florida who happened to have been connected with Shambhala and they told me I had to come to this place called Karma Choling and uh, in Vermont and I ought to come do this thing called the Dhatun, uh-huh. you know, 28 day meditation retreat and I was just kind of naive enough to think I could do that. So what was that like for you living in, you lived in Florida? I did, but that was just a brief period. I, I, my primary time in my career was really in uh, Northern Virginia. Mm-hmm. Went to law school in um, mm-hmm. Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. and practiced mm-hmm. law in Fairfax County. Wow. So what was that like coming from that world into... So you came here for a dot and a month-long meditation program. I did. I did. Well, it was revolutionary for me personally. You mm-hmm. know, I, I sort of felt like I finally found my home. And I think particularly here at Karma Choling. You know, mm-hmm. it, it was such a potent place I could feel the lineage here uh, of great teachers starting with Trump Rinpoche um, and I think I immediately resonated with, with what they were teaching about just how to live a good decent human life. So for those who don't know who was this Trump Rinpoche <laughs> character? You know Waylon Lewis. I know, I know. But... <laughs> Well, he was an amazing man who escaped during the, the time when the Chinese were taking over Tibet, and he escaped. He was a great teacher in Tibet. He had his own monastery, and 
He escaped with a large group of people who he managed to get through the Himalayas. Um, and if people are interested, there's this great book. Called Born in Tibet, yeah. which tells the whole story. Yeah. But through a long it's set fun. of circumstances, as you know, uh, yeah. lots of interesting stories. He actually landed here um, mm. because some of his students bought this piece of land in Vermont, which was a dairy farm. They bought it for mm. him. And this is where he began to teach in North America. He'd been teaching in Europe, uh, in England, in Scotland. He'd gone to Oxford to study mm -hmm. world religions. Um, I think he was just probably destined to um, be coming to the West. Yeah, so my father actually lived here back in, I forgot that until just now. I mean, I know it overall, but, uh, you know, way back whenever. Yeah, it was 1970. May so of 1970. My dad was here. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he landed here and started teaching in a tent and upstairs and in the town hall in the town of Barnet. Right. Uh, there's great pictures you've seen of yeah. like a basketball yeah. uh, hoop behind him. Um, yeah. But, you know, this is where the entire Shambhala uh, thing really began. So for people who can, obviously you can't see, but we're in the middle of sort of nowhere in Vermont. Yeah. It's, Stunningly beautiful trees everywhere. It's the yeah. Vermont you see in postcards, basically. It is, yeah. Uh, farms and beautiful old houses, mm -hmm. and um, so for this kind of crazy wisdom uh, teacher, as he was called, uh, yeah. to come from Tibet and teach here back in seventy, whatever. Yeah, the then, early seventies, yeah. yeah. Um, and we're actually in the old part of the. We are. The we're original. in the original part of the house. Um, it was owned by the family, the Patnode family, and hmm. Joe and Alice sold the land. And uh, Alice continued. Joe died quite early, but Alice lived until she was a hundred, which I think was maybe two years ago. She finally died. Wow. But yeah, they ran a farm, and then they eventually sold the land to these three ladies, who um, wanted it for their teacher. Right. So today, karma chilling is maybe give give us a little idea of what it does and yeah. all that. Yeah, well, we're 717 acres of absolutely gorgeous land. We're in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, as it's called. And um, we host programs really primarily based on the lineage of Shambhala, which really is about living a good human life right now with your jobs, your family, your everything there's nothing left out but we also do host other things um, we do host um, other people who are curious about how to lead that kind of a life last year we hosted the Vermont Leadership Institute which that's is a, like, what is that it's a year-long actually it's a nine month long program uh, of people who've been selected from around the state of Vermont who are leaders in their various sectors, whether it's government, it could be legislators, right. um, et cetera. But so basically you're open to host any program that's dedicated to being a benefit to the society or Absolutely. something like that, yeah. social good. Absolutely. And we also have this amazing garden, which right. uh, is, I think, more and more kind of central uh, in a certain way to what we're doing uh, yeah. in terms of living a, a decent life and uh so yeah. what's amazing about the garden yeah i know there's gardens everywhere right Right. well we have not this, enough but right we have this um gentleman jan antoven who's dutch who comes from many generations of farmers in uh holland and he came here and about 20 years ago and landed and decided he wanted to do f gardening even different than his family had done it and over these years, he's worked this one piece of land here, which is uh, one acre. And he continues to learn how to mix his spiritual practice in with working with the land, which is, you know, so important. And so it's, it, you know, we're teaching lots of people how to work the land from this very contemplative point of view. And we just started our first garden in apprenticeship this year, which is really great. Huh. Yeah, I thought people had been learning in the garden for many years they have they've been doing internships but this mm. is literally they come for nine months and wow. they start in the spring and they go through the fall so they get to wow. see the whole cycle of you know planting to harvesting so and you know what is so if someone would were to come for that do they have to be buddhist and what does spiritual or contemplative mean right. in that context yeah or? no they definitely don't have to be buddhist okay. sort of anybody who would like to 
work with land and food from a thoughtful point mm-hmm. of view, from a point of view of you know doing the least harm mm. and creating really potent food, uh, nutrient-rich food. Um, Jan really works a lot with the soil. He's very committed to making the most healthy soil. Mm. It's very interesting how he works with bugs and he doesn't till land, which is unusual. Uh, most people who farm till their land sure. and turn it over or mulch it and huh. fertilize it. And he doesn't do any of those things. He really just uses what's available and creates this incredibly beautiful and tasty. I think we figured out we have about $25,000 worth of food that comes out of that garden every season. And we don't just feed Carmichole, we also feed some of the neighbors and we do donate some food along the way as well. So yeah, that leads naturally to um, how does Carmichole in this sort of weird in a positive way, (laughs) Buddhist or Buddhist-ish center mm-hmm. um which i say buddhist because you're open to other yes. things but mm-hmm. um how does what's your relationship like with the general community here in vermont well vermonters are wonderful in that they really appreciate you know perseverance and mm-hmm. we've now been here 43 years wow. so they they don't sort of they see us as people like them who came and really stayed uh-huh. And we, um, we're also a very large economic energy uh, engine for this particular area, which is one of the poorer parts of Vermont. We, we have a you know, post office and a store in our tiny, tiny town that wouldn't exist if it weren't for Carmichole and the numbers of people who come through. And you know, we provide jobs. We have a lot of local people who actually work here now who aren't Buddhist, mm-hmm. um, but That's who... Cool find this a decent, uh, interesting place to work. We have cooks and housekeepers and um, so, um, and we've made friends with our neighbors. I think people see us very much as good neighbors now. So a typical way, switching gears a little bit, that someone would interact with mm-hmm. karma Scholing is you live in Boston or Montreal mm-hmm. or wherever and yeah. you, or anywhere, and you come for a program here, right? Right. Yes. And what do you do when you're, <laughs> uh, I know things like Rhoda, and like what is the life here when you're yeah. here? Yeah, yeah, well this this center is very much based on a community mm-hmm. and the sense of community mm-hmm. and we're all kind of learning what it means to live together in that kind of intentional, decent fashion and so... How many people live here? There's about 30 people who okay. live here, um, either, either here in the main house that we're in right now or we have a guest house in um, the town and we have some of our staff live there but we really sort of invite people into this experiment of of working with a good human society and so when you come you get sort of folded into that life you'll learn of course you'll be in your program but you also will interact a lot with the staff in terms of doing rota which as you know is part of the deal which is we take care of our selves so we do our own dishes and we clean up and you know we take care of the shrines and all those kinds of things so it's called rota because it rotates correct yeah yeah that's one thing i love that it's not this i've gone to a million programs over the past years through elephant and it's almost always this sort of consumer relationship when you go to a place and you kind of get treated right and expect to get treated right and then there's people who you barely see who make everything happen yeah, we really are working hard to make that it not like that yeah. because I think that's where the juice is. You know, mm-hmm. that's where it's really mm-hmm. interesting is the irritation of being in the dish room and uh, finding, you know, watching your mind through that, which is, you know, of course, what you begin to learn as a meditator is how your life brings you all kinds of circumstances to um, wake up. Yeah, so I lived here, as I mentioned, uh, for years, and one thing I really loved about it is you would, you know, whether you're falling in love or just working (laughs) with people or fighting with people, whatever it is, the next day you see them at breakfast. Absolutely. So there's this organic community in the Mm -hmm. sense of um, you don't have to usually schedule a meeting with people. You just run into people, and and, um, it's really true community here, and... um, uh, and so there's 30 people live here and then there's however many who are here for a program. Yeah, it can be up to, you know, 250 people in the summer. Right. You know, we just finished family camp, which is yeah. a whole nother kind of community experience, you know, with kids running everywhere. But How many also, children? 
Well, I think more than half were kids. Wow. So it was a lot of kids and fun. all ages. It was totally fun. Yeah. And they really get, you know, the community, it, it, it becomes just one big community, actually, yeah. very much so with family camp. And then tell me about the whole donut phenomenon. The donut phenomenon. Yeah, that's the group of people who have moved here to specifically to be near Carmacholing. Yeah. Quite a few people from Boston, um, and we're finding a lot of second home people who may live in Boston but have a second home up here in order to be near Carmacholing. And they're also part of our community. They're very um, important to us. They yeah. take on lots of volunteering, and uh, we enjoy each other's company. We do holidays together. We um, It just kind of extends the Carmacholing mm -hmm. community, which is great. Yeah, so that's one of my favorite memories is the different holidays and all the different people who come through, and it's just such a sort of rich in the uh, basic mm -hmm. sense of the word yeah. uh, way of life here. So um, I know after seven years you're retiring soon. I am. Right? I am. Which is partially why I, I jumped out here because I hung <laughs> out with Joe Shea and he said you were retiring. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to connect before, like, too much of my connection was gone. Right. Um, so how has it been for you? I know you said you enjoy your life. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you could talk about sort of the leadership, the authentic mm. leadership notion. Yeah, well, I think in Jambala we're just trying to, we're, we're practicing to be, you know, genuine people talking from the heart. And I think that is a different kind of leadership I've had to learn, you know, coming from the mm. legal world where everything's about aggression. Mm -hmm. um, it's been very interesting to see how the power of gentleness and the mm -hmm. power of care um, in terms of leadership. It's not just about um, knowing it or um, making people do things. It's definitely about inviting their wisdom. It's a lot about creating the space for people to grow as people and then grow as leaders. And so for me, it's been a real journey of a different kind of leadership. And uh, I've really, it's a lot more fun and a lot more interesting, actually, than being somebody's boss. So how is it different than, I mean, you are people's boss, technically. I am. I you're, am. you're responsible for the health and whatever of Kermit Schilling. Right. But you relate to people as human beings, not I, as employees or something. I do. And what I find is that the byproduct of that is that actually you get the best work mm -hmm. and um, the happiest situation for people when mm. they feel your care and you genuinely respect them and feel they have something to offer and that, mm. you know, we could do this together. Mm. That I don't have all the answers, that I'm responsible for guiding the ship but that I can't do that without them. So, I mean, that sounds nice theoretically. I know. But how do you, I mean, gentleness, there's like always gentleness and precision. Or, yeah. You know, um, in my experience of being a boss, which is um, very difficult, I think, mm -hmm. for me, because I'm very good entrepreneur, I'm very good doing yeah. my own thing, being yeah. a cowboy, but then having to work with, people as a boss I didn't enjoy being an employee even right. though I had great mentors but um, so I always try and treat them as human beings mm -hmm. and uh, I expect a lot of them I think partially because I respect them and mm -hmm. I think they're human not employees right who need to clock in but the hard side of that is to me I feel like there's a level of like you treat everyone right and then at the end of the day sometimes the performance or the ambition or the desire, the mm -hmm. hunger to really accomplish goals together isn't always there. It's true. No, it's true. So and that's I, a question. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think that um, there is that, that that occurs, but I think also um, we have a different ambition here. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, this isn't just uh, another workplace. Yeah. Um, I often talk about it as, you know, short term, long term. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't get the most performance out right. of them but if they develop as a human being and they develop their ability to access mm. their own wisdom over the long haul I've offered something to the world by offering them back in a, in a place that they weren't when they came here so maybe I don't get the most out of them 
from a performance point of view, but or think, from a goals of karma showing point of view. But I think from the long term point of view, which is what we're all about, is this quality of creating so society that then I hope to send them out being, you know, really genuine, decent, hard working, wise people that can help change the world. Hmm. There's this great quote what you said reminded me of by um, the author of Petit Prince, Little uh-huh, Prince. Of course, Saint Ex of Exupéry. Exupéry. I'm glad you said that, not not to me. Yes. Um, but he says, you, you maybe know this quote. He says, if you want people to learn how to to be great sailors or something mm-hmm. like that, you know that quote. No, I don't. He said, don't tell them how to, you know, raise the sails and do this and that and yet, you know, all, all the details. Mm-hmm. Um, teach them a longing for the sea. Yeah. And then like all the rest follows. I think that's I. That resonates for me, for sure. And I I think this community is so much about that. You know, it's so much about all of us teaching each other and growing as human beings. We're really raising human beings here. And then we send them out and they can do, they're doing all kinds of amazing Mm. things out there. And I, that's, Mm. that's the thing I feel the happiest about is leaving here knowing Mm. that there's probably several hundred young, wonderful human beings who've come out of here who are going to make a difference in the world. I don't have any doubt about that. Well, I hope to be one of them because I definitely, I was telling people yesterday, I was running into old friends here, mm-hmm. literally old because it's been 14 years, right. so I haven't seen them for a while, and they were saying, you know, how's, how's my life, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And I was saying, um, you know, I was so, I did well in college mm-hmm. and I loved Boston and I, it wasn't all black and white, but I generally was sort of miserable and de- mm-hmm. desperately lonely because mm-hmm. there wasn't any community. I'd come out of Carmen Schulling where it was like right. St. John's Bear Academy yeah. here in Vermont, and there was amazing community at both. And so I would visit here, and I would practice and study the Dharma, the teachings of Buddhism and mm-hmm. meditation and Dorje Kasung and mm-hmm. all that. And uh, it really, it didn't teach me. It like really showed me mm-hmm. who... I could be or was yeah. fundamentally, and uh, without that, you know. Well, there you go, Wayne. Yeah. That's the story. Yeah. So I think, you know, from a sort of, if we're really looking to change the planet, you know, to try to bring it back from the brink, yeah. it, you know, that's really human work. So we're sort of working mm. at that level that we can send human beings out who pay attention to those things mm. instead of, you know, mechanized you know, again, almost materialistic consumer training our people to work in a sort of consuming point of view. You know, this is a much long-term, longer-term view, actually. Yeah, which is much more human and mm-hmm. natural mm-hmm. as well. Um, so is there anything I haven't asked you <laughs> that maybe you always want to be asked in interviews or something you don't mm-hmm. get feel like is addressed or something you're proud of or... Yeah, I think I'm just what I said. I'm the most proud of the people.